Senator Markey has been representing Massachusetts since the 1970s, first as a member of the House and since a 2013 special election as a member of the Senate. And he's been a leader on nuclear issues for decades, one of the Senate's leading nuclear experts. He's a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He co-chairs the Nuclear Weapons and Arms Control Working Group. He founded the Nonproliferation Caucus. He was the Senate leader for the Green New Deal. He chairs the Subcommittee on Clean Air, Climate, and Nuclear Safety of the Committee on Environment and Public Works. He's proposed a range of legislation to reduce nuclear dangers over the years, including laws that would prohibit the president from using nuclear weapons first without consulting Congress, laws to tighten controls on trade in nuclear technology, and legislation intended to lay the foundation for a new nuclear freeze movement. He's long been critical of the U.S. nuclear industry's safety and security practices. And here in Massachusetts, he's been pushing to ensure that the decommissioning of the Pilgrim nuclear power plant follows all the relevant laws and meets the concerns of its neighbors. So, Senator Markey, um, nuclear issues have been sort of on the back burner of public concern for a long time. But now with the war in Ukraine... Uh, with events in Iran and China's buildup and North Korea's frenzied pace of nuclear testing, they're on the front pages again. Uh, and especially with the possibility that Russia might use nuclear weapons in Ukraine and the risks posed by the Russian occupation of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. What do you see as the most important steps we should take to reduce those dangers? So, thank you. And, uh, thank you for, um, inviting me uh, to come over to the Belper Center. I very much appreciate the uh, honor of being with you uh, and with this incredibly uh, distinguished uh, audience that uh, has gathered here today. Very much uh, appreciate uh, all of your attention to this suite of issues. So Mark Twain may or may not have said it, but the quote is attributed to him that um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does tend to rhyme. So this period right now doesn't uh, uh, doesn't uh, maybe have the exact same contours, but it does rhyme with the early 80s when Ronald Reagan decided that he was walking away from all nuclear arms control negotiations. And so for the first time since the Eisenhower years, the United States was not at the table with the Soviet Union. And that's why I then introduced in the House and Senator Kennedy introduced into the Senate the nuclear freeze resolution. And we did that in March of 1982. And by June of 1982, we had one million people in Central Park around the nuclear freeze resolution. Still the largest single gathering of Americans in one place in our country's history. And it was around nuclear arms control. It was about the fact that the U.S. and USSR was not talking. And that every one of the new nuclear weapons systems that the United States wanted to build um, uh, uh, were on the blueprints of the arms contractors and the Pentagon were now given the green light. And there was obviously going to be a corresponding uh, response from uh, the Soviet Union. And, uh, and it justifiably scared people. Um, because before we decided discussing climate change as an existential threat, nuclear weapons were already there as an existential threat and something that could only be controlled by active attention paid to it. And so the goal was obviously to have a movement in the same way that I introduced the Green New Deal with the Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. We needed a movement on climate change. Nothing was happening. We need to get people into it, moving people, right? Saying it's urgent uh, and not allowing it to be a back burner issue. Uh, and so uh, at, the, uh, at the end of 1982, um, I wrote a book called Nuclear Peril, The Politics of Proliferation. So this book came out 40 years ago last month on the politics of proliferation in the United States and the world with a forward from Senator Edward Kennedy. And 
And much of this uh, was about the fact that the United States and Soviet Union were engaged in a race and we were trying to tell other countries to stop. And we were simultaneously selling nuclear power plants around the world uh, and not having them be under the full scope safeguards, which they needed to be under. Uh, and as we know, nuclear power plants have a dual identity. Uh, in the right hands, they're generators of electricity that had this unfortunate byproduct, you know, that involves very dangerous, uh, radioactive material. In the hands of the long people, it's a generator of really dangerous material that has a wonderful byproduct of electricity. And we continued to pretend that we could sell these power plants without having a long-term price that we had to pay. So it's 40 years later. The architecture um, that was in place 40 years ago has helped to slow down the pace at which other countries get attention to it. Um, in fact, what I did in 1983 in October was I called over to the Kennedy School and I said, if I could get uh, Vice President Mondale and John Glenn and Gary Hart to all come to the Kennedy School, would you have a debate on nuclear arms control. And I will said, I said I would get it televised nationally. So in October of 1983 at the Kennedy School, with me introducing and concluding that debate, we had one hour on nuclear arms control with the presidential candidates. By the way, contrast that with 2016 on climate change, when no reporter asked uh, either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump about um, climate change in 2016. So the Green New Deal fixed that problem. Okay. Or about so, nuclear weapons. Or about power. nuclear weapons, exactly. <laughs> so here we are now in uh, in uh, uh, 2023, and uh, Putin uh, has been threatening the use of nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine. Um, nuclear power plants um, have been used uh, as part of uh, tactical maneuvering by the Russians in, uh, in that country. Um, uh, we see a rise in uh, the um, attention being paid and the desire for nuclear weapons, obviously in Iran, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, in uh, North Korea, in, in China, says that it's going into a full bore uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, production. Uh, so it's time for the United States to reclaim the mantle of leadership of diplomacy, and to make it a front burner issue. Uh, climate change is an existential issue, so isn't nuclear uh, weapons uh, control. And we have to make sure that we make it an issue, and that's why I am so glad that uh, you have invited me here today to have the uh, conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, we have a situation now where the nuclear dangers are higher than they've been in a long time with the war in Ukraine, and yet the conversation that you need to do anything about the nuclear dangers is more difficult because of the war in Ukraine. Almost all U.S.-Russian communications are cut off at this point, including arms control talks, and we have the last remaining strategic arms control agreement expiring in February of 2026. So what do you see as the next steps and the importance of maintaining some kind of arms control structure? Well, the, the new START agreement in 2010 puts a cap at 1,550 you know, nuclear warheads apiece that can be deployable in either country. And you're right. We should already begin the negotiations with uh, Russia in terms of a 2026 agreement to further lower those thresholds. That's important. Um, the good news is that we have had these negotiations that have gone on uh, since the nuclear freeze movement drove uh, Reagan back to the negotiating table with Gorbachev and Reykjavik in 1985. Thank goodness the architecture is there. So there are ongoing conversations uh, between our national security advisor and secretary of state and their counterparts in Russia because we have an architecture that allows for those kinds of uh, discussions to uh, continue. Um, and even as recently, however, as yesterday, 
you know, Medvedev uh, basically once again threatened the use of uh, nuclear weapons, which was kind of clarified today by the uh, by the Russians. Uh, but even in clarifying it, they said that we just are going to maintain our existing policy, which is that they can use nuclear weapons. So it's it's very important for the United States uh, to continue to put diplomacy front and center, uh, to be ensuring that we're negotiating um, uh, on an ongoing, a uh, personal basis with uh, with their leaders, but to do the same thing with China because we don't have the same kind of architecture with China. There is no pre-existing uh, uh, negotiation architecture, so we need to create one. Uh, I've introduced something called the Assure Act uh, into the Senate, which would help to create that architecture so that we would have a way uh, of, of, of ensuring that there's ongoing conversation so that an accident, a mistake does not happen. And that's the greatest risk that because of a lack of communication um, in the fog of war, uh, we see an unnecessary escalation uh, in the use of nuclear weapons. So, um, so. This is just something that I think is very important for people who care about this issue to now get engaged. Okay. That we have to put more attention on this issue and we have to make sure that our government is the leader. No, we, we can't be sitting on the sidelines, uh, uh, allowing for events you know, to take control uh, of the world without our direct ongoing and, um, vigorous, um, uh, intervention. Well, you've raised the issue of China, and China, as uh, many in the audience know, is now building hundreds of new nuclear missile silos, and there's growing tensions between the United States and China over Taiwan, over the South China Sea. I know that you visited Taiwan here personally uh, recently. Um, tell me about what you think we need to do to reduce the danger of some kind of conflict uh, with China and manage this growing competition? Um, well, first, I think we need to uh, say that we're not in a new Cold War. We don't need that kind of rhetoric. Uh, uh, we need something like my Assure Act so that we have an architecture that's in place, so that we are talking, so that we don't allow events to kind of slip out of our control, that there's ongoing communication at the highest level militarily and diplomatically uh, between the United States and um, uh, and uh, China. Uh, we have to assure China uh, that we want to maintain the one China policy. We want to maintain the policy of strategic ambiguity, um, that we want to provide Taiwan with the um, defensive capability, which they need, but... Uh, but that, um, but at looking at, at, at from a larger uh, perspective at our relationship with China, uh, we want to work with them on climate change. We want to work with them on resolving economic issues. We want to work uh, with them on semiconductor issues all the way down the line uh, that we need to have a very broad perspective as to uh, the relationship that we have with China. Uh, but at the same time, say that if anything happens in Taiwan, it will not be because of Taiwan or U.S. policy. It will be a change in China policy uh, that leads to any change or any escalation uh, there uh, in Taiwan. So a balance of competition and cooperation designed to address common concerns and maintain the status quo in areas where we disagree. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think it's imperative um, that we work very hard um, to engage um, China. Uh, I was in Egypt uh, uh, in the first week of November at the climate summit, uh, and I know uh, Sec John Kerry was working very hard uh, to elicit positive responses from um, the Chinese government. Uh, I think we have to build on his efforts and just continue to work with them. Obviously, we cannot solve the climate crisis if China is not uh, involved. And, you know, to, the Chinese have a point that, you know, 25% of the CO2 up in the atmosphere is red, white, and blue because we were the historical leader in industrializing. So they've got a point on that. Uh, but at the same time, um, China is now the leading 
uh, emitter. And we have a basis for partnering with them uh, on that issue, uh, which is why our passage uh, of the Inflation Reduction Act or the Climate Solutions Act is what we should call it to deploy wind and solar, all electric vehicles, plug in hybrids, battery storage technologies across our country. That gives us some credibility. You cannot preach temperance from a bar stool. You can't tell someone's drinking is bad from, for you with a beer in your hand. Um, uh, smoking is bad for you with a cigarette in your hand. So we have to stop. We have to reduce. The same thing is true when it comes to nuclear weapons. We can't be simultaneously telling other countries it's bad while trying to authorize uh, the new Sentinel uh, ICBM while trying to authorize the new submarine-launched uh, cruise missiles. Okay? You, you can't have it both ways. You can't preach temperance from a bar. You have to actually have the, the confidence in your own philosophy. And in that way, we're, we, we, we're going to be in a better position with the Chinese across the board to have some credibility as we come to the table. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and again, as I said earlier, adding in economic and other issues uh, helps to ensure that it's not it's just not a, a one issue discussion that we're having. Let's uh, turn to Iran for a moment. Um, with President Trump's pullout from the nuclear deal, Iran has now advanced to the point where they could make several bombs worth of nuclear material very rapidly. And now in Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu has returned to power, who was uh, one of those who most seriously considered the option of carrying out military strikes. And so I wonder what the dangers of a real crisis over Iran's nuclear program in the months to come may be. And if you see any path forward for reducing those dangers. Well, you know, sow the wind, reap the whirlwind. So, you know, we had an agreement that uh, John Kerry, uh, uh, Secretary Moniz, um, and uh, Barack Obama were able to negotiate with the Iranians. It was working. It was in place. It was verifiable. We had the IAEA all over Iran looking at their nuclear program. So it was a very effective um, architecture which had been put in place uh, and Donald Trump just decided to destroy it. Uh, and now uh, it is a, a much more problematic situation, no question about it. It should not relieve us of the responsibility to continue to work hard diplomatically uh, to try to put some kind of substitute system in place. Not the original Iran deal, but some form of an architecture uh, that allows for uh, monitoring of their nuclear program while trying to make concessions on other issues that they might care about. Uh, but it's imperative that we do so because there is a domino effect in the Middle East that would go to Saudi Arabia, then onto Egypt, et cetera, et cetera, if we do not have a successful outcome of this Iranian uh, uh, nuclear uh, negotiation. So I would just I would just praise the Biden administration. They've worked very hard, you know, to try to find a way to uh, revivify uh, the um, the Biden uh, Iran deal. Uh, it's difficult, uh, but the alternative is unthinkable in terms of what it could unleash uh, in the Middle East in terms of a nuclear arms race. It is a very difficult circumstance that uh, now with the protests in Iran and you know any deal with Iran potentially uh, unleashing tens of billions of, of dollars, it's a very tricky situation. I I uh, am nervous that the Biden administration seems to have decided, particularly given Iran's reluctance to return to the deal as it was, to just put things on the back burner for the time being when Iran is right at the edge of this nuclear uh, potential capability. I don't think we can put it on the back burner because um, Saudi Arabia has put it on the front burner. 
they have made it very clear that they're going to pursue a nuclear weapons program. Well, and indeed, the Minister of Energy in Saudi Arabia just recently said, uh, uh, confirmed that they planned to enrich uranium themselves. Exactly. And does, does uh, Saudi Arabia need a civilian nuclear power plant capacity to develop uh, an electrical generating capacity? Uh, the number one oil and gas, you know, country in the world. And when I, when I watched, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, it was very warm when, uh, <laughs> when Lawrence was walking around during the day and very windy at night, very cold at night. So obviously they have a lot of resources, wind and solar in Saudi Arabia, if they want to find a very inexpensive way to generate electricity. That's not their goal. This just goes back to nuclear peril, the politics of proliferation. They want a nuclear power plant because of the side uh, benefits that come from it, not the principal benefits of electricity, right? It's, oh, wonderful. We get access to all this dual-purpose uh, nuclear technology that we can then put into a nuclear uh, weapons program. And that becomes, our, that becomes really our challenge uh, because we, again... We have to be the leader because we're either going to live together or we're going to die together. We're going to know each other or we're going to exterminate each other. And when those missiles, those nuclear bombs start to be deployed against other countries, the least that we should be able to say is that we tried. We really tried to avoid that nuclear conflict. Uh, and we're at a real tipping point now in the Middle East. And the United States has to ensure that we're doing everything we can uh, to stop it. But on the Saudi side, um, nothing should happen in that country that does not have a full scope safeguards program on it. One, two, three agreement. Uh, and, uh, and if they do begin to pursue nuclear weapons or, or delivery capability, uh, my view is that we should just cut off all arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Just absolutely be very clear with regard to the price they're going to pay. The United States has to be the leader. So on both in, in both of those situations, I think it's absolutely imperative that, um, that we be active, aggressive, uh, to ensure that we kind of keep this 40 years of good work, you know, uh, in place and continuing on into the future. It's getting more complicated, more difficult, but we have an unavoidable responsibility to be the global leader. More than 40 years, indeed. Uh, a couple of years ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty in 1970. You may not know this, but my father was one of the negoti U.S. negotiators. So tell us about that. NPT. Yeah. So uh, um, he was not by any means the lead negotiator, uh, but he and his Soviet counterpart, who became close friends during the course of the negotiations, and remain friends for the rest of their lives were often assigned when the parties couldn't come up with a solution to anything to go off and try to work something out. And uh, in particular, in the summer of 1967, uh, there was a total deadlock over inspections. And um, the U.S. side was instructed not to change its position at all. And the Soviet side was instructed not to change its position at all. And so they were getting nowhere. And that rapidly became obvious uh, to each side that the other was instructed not to change their position. So my father and his counterpart, Roland Timurbayev, uh, another Soviet and another American, went for a hike in the mountains and uh, cut a deal uh, during the course of the hike with which they committed to paper on the cable car on the way back down. <laughs> and, uh, they agreed that the Americans would report it as a Soviet suggestion and the Soviets would report it as an American suggestion and that way nobody had violated their instructions. <laughs> well, that's how the safeguards article of the NPT after some more tweaking wow. came to be. <laughs> well, that, that's all in here. My book. <laughs> but not run your father and not... Uh, the, in the atmosphere of ambiguity, we got a treaty and, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, still survives. In the same way, actually, in 62... Kennedy and Khrushchev, they worked inside an atmosphere of Indeed. ambiguity as well uh, in order to get that 
agreement. And, um, and I will tell you my little story. I was a sophomore at Malden Catholic in, uh, in, uh, March of 1962. I was a sophomore at Malden Catholic and I have no scientific ability at all, but I'm an overachiever. So there was a science fair. And my father worked at the Hood Milk Company. He drove a truck for the Hood Milk Company. And he heard me talking at the kitchen table that I wanted to have a science project. He said, I'll take you over to the Hood Milk Company. We have a, we have a laboratory on the roof of the Hood Milk Company in, Ch- in Charlestown with about 20 scientists in there. So I walk in and they explain to me that in addition to homogenization and pasteurization, they're going to add a new process for strontium-90 removal because the U.S. and USSR have all of these nuclear clouds that they travel hundreds and thousands of miles. And when it rains, the strontium-90 goes into the grass. The cows eat the grass. They produce the milk and it's going into the children of the United States and the world. So they had to add a third process for strontium removal. So they gave me the design. I took it home. I have to admit my father pretty much built it for me in the basement. <laughs> and I won an award. Huh? I won an That's award. Great. I'm all together. My picture is in the newspaper in uh, March of 1962. Although my father said, Eddie, Eddie, you had the whole thing backwards when you were explaining it. You shouldn't be a scientist. You should be a politician. Okay. If you could <laughs> win an award, explain it because the power of it. And anyway, one year later, it was one year later, Khrushchev and Kennedy signed the atmospheric nuclear test bin. I'm not saying my science project was the key. <laughs> But I was at least a year ahead, okay, in terms of the need for the program. And here's the interesting thing about that. The Nobel Peace Prize did not go to Kennedy or Khrushchev. It went to Linus Pauling, who had become, who had begun the public health movement around it. Right. The Green New Deal, right? The nuclear freeze. He's the one that won the award, creating this public movement, you know, to protect the children of the planet. So, and it, that was his second of all. He won one for chemistry and one for peace. Okay. Uh, He's uh, still the only person to have two unshared uh, Nobel Prizes. I think he may be. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, uh, I know that Madame Curie won two Nobel Prizes, and the all male uh, French Academy of Sciences still would not admit her. Okay? That's how bad. The male dominated sciences were in the early part of the 20th century. So I, I think she fits in there with Linus yeah. Pauling. Yeah. So, um, we still haven't gotten to North Korea. Okay. Let's go, which has been doing, um, really, a, a, an amazing, uh, pace of missile testing. Uh, it's not obvious to me what exactly they're signaling since at the same time they're saying they don't want to come to the table. Um, we have the South Korean president in response saying, gee, maybe we ought to put U.S. nuclear weapons back in South Korea or build some of our own. Uh, tell me a little bit about your thoughts on what we should do about the dangers on the Korean peninsula. Well, I think first, we don't want the South Koreans to be building their own nuclear weapons any more than we want the Japanese to be building their own nuclear weapons. We have to give them assurances that they are going to continue uh, to be uh, protected as part of that historical agreement that we've had with both of those countries. Uh, we need to uh, ensure that there's not an escalation of tensions, uh, but a management of what already exists in, a, in an attempt to uh, reduce tensions, not increase them. So so to the extent to which um, President Yoon may be um, um, talking uh, uh, about their own nuclear weapons program or a reintroduction of American uh, uh, weapons, uh, nuclear weapons into South Korea, which were removed, you know, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, we don't need to see that escalation. Okay. We should just try to, I think, focus upon Kim and his issues uh, and to, to continue to try to engage with him in using, you know, a global alliance in order to, um, uh, let the, let him know that it's just unacceptable the direction in which he's going. By the way, the same kind of global alliance that came together when Putin last October started to talk about the uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Um, China said, "Do not do that." India said, "Do not do that." Uh, to Putin, uh, as well as the whole rest of the planet. Well, that's what we should be organizing. That kind of a chorus saying uh, to North Korea, as we had the world. 
in a chorus say to Putin, don't even think that you can move in that direction without becoming a pariah internationally for at least another, for a generation, uh, if you, if you uh, undertake those kind of activities. So I think that's really our, you know, our responsibility is to try to organize, you know, a, a, u- a unified global response to everything that North Korea is doing and not escalate, but try to de-escalate. So in a moment, I'm going to open it up to the room for questions. Um, and I don't honestly remember whether there's an option for those watching the webinar to ask questions or not. I'm getting the nod that there is. So those online uh, should uh, think of your questions um, as well. Uh, but let me ask one more uh, uh, thought, and that is... Um, has to do with presidential sole authority over the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, in our system, it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit strange. Uh, no one is allowed, everything is two-person rule throughout the system. You have to have at least two people involved in everything you do with a nuclear weapon. Uh, you know, I have nuclear weapon design clearances, but I'm not allowed to be alone with a nuclear weapon, except... The most important thing, which is launching them, the president is allowed to do by himself. But you've got, in the past, sponsored legislation with Representative Liu on that subject. Um, Tell us your thoughts about what we should be doing there. Well, on January 6th of 2021, we learned, once again, what happens when a president is out of control. and believes that he can act unilaterally on, on his own behalf, for his own predilections. It's dangerous. Um, there were no checks and balances, that's obvious, at that time. So nuclear weapons really poses the greatest threat. Um, Congressman Liu from California and I introduced legislation six, seven years ago on this subject, and it's still pending, to um, uh, to absolutely prohibit any president from unilaterally using a nuclear weapon against a country that has not used a nuclear weapon against us. To be the first to use a nuclear weapon in that kind of a situation. Uh, and uh, to pursue that discussion, I, I actually said to Senator Corker, who was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee at that time, 2017, we should have a hearing on the authorization for the use of nuclear weapons. There had not been a hearing in 30 years in the United States Senate on that issue. And we had this expert panel, especially of kind of old timers who came back to just explain what the system was. And I want to tell you, the members of the Senate Prime Relations Committee just sat there in silence and heard how much power the president has. For all intents and purposes, he's on the phone with the head of the Strategic Air Committee and the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. They can listen in if they want, but they don't have any say. It's just the president making a decision to watch, even if there has not been a nuclear attack against our country. So from my perspective, that should be a power reserved to the Congress that we should have to vote on the use of nuclear weapons when we have not been attacked with nuclear weapons. Uh, We should have the authority. We should have the debate on the House and Senate floor. Uh, The president should have to come to us to get the authorization to uh, to use those weapons. Uh, And I just think it's a very important discussion for us to have. Now, in President Biden's uh, uh, Nuclear Posture Review of 2022, uh, they they did not adopt that position, which I think is a mistake. Uh, it was something that candidate Biden said that he was moving towards, but when the Nuclear Posture Review was completed last fall, it did not include that, uh, that ban on a president being able to use it without getting authorization from the Congress. So I'm going to continue to you know, move uh, uh, that ball to continue to have that discussion. 
Um, we're not assured that we're always going to have Joe Biden as president. We could very easily have Donald Trump again. There was a poll out yesterday saying that he was up by 18 points over DeSantis nationally. Again, you don't want to ride the polar coaster day in and day out. Nobody really knows about two years from now. But you got to protect yourself against a Trump or Trump-like figure um, getting his finger on the uh, on the uh, on the button uh, without some constraints, uh, especially if we have not been attacked with nuclear weapons. So I'm going to continue to pursue that. I think it's a very very important um, uh, debate discussion for our country to have. Well, and that whole issue of the reliance that the world has on the judgment of the leaders of states that have nuclear weapons and the sort of decision-making process and environment uh, is one we're looking at closely. Um, my group here at the Kennedy School has gotten a grant to launch a global research network on the theme of rethinking nuclear deterrence. And we have several working groups on different aspects of that. Uh, and certainly the whole issue of sort of the psychology and decision science behind uh, nuclear decisions is going to be one key element of what we're looking at. So let me open it up to uh, questions. I saw John's hand first, so let me turn it to John Holdren. For those of you in the room who don't know, uh, John Holdren is a faculty member here at the Kennedy School and was President Obama's science advisor for the full eight years of President Obama's term. Thank you, Matt. And Senator Markey, thank you for your 40-plus years of leadership, both on nuclear weapon issues and on nuclear power issues. And I want to ask you about the second of those. In the context of Ukraine, uh, one of the things that has been underscored by that disastrous uh, invasion of Ukraine by, by Putin and company is the dangers that nuclear power plants pose in a wartime environment. Uh, you and I and Matt and a lot of others have known about that for a long time, but there couldn't be a more uh, potent illustration than what has already happened at Zaporizhia, what could happen further uh, in the domain of uh, attacks, even conventional attacks on nuclear power plants. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what the world needs to do, what we need to do, what could possibly be done to reduce the dangers of nuclear power plants in war zones? Um, or non-war zones, after 9-11, it was very clear that the nuclear power plants in the United States did not have sufficient security around them, and that they were right at the top of the terrorist target list within our own country. Those 120 nuclear power plants that were here, from the Pilgrim to the Seabrook plant in this region, all across the country. So we had to basically legislatively force a dramatic increase in the security around those plants here domestically. Uh, and we you know we haven't really seen a repetition of 9-11, um, uh, with the exception of the uh, the marathon bombing, uh, but it's 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 something that we had to be conscious of here. Uh, again, internationally, we know that they're terrorist targets. We know that they're high value um, targets for uh, other governments that would want to terrorize a nation. So I just believe that, like the incredible Fuhrer, which I think was very helpful to say that the IAEA should be allowed in to the inspector should be allowed in Chernobyl at Zaporizhia uh, in Ukraine that we just have a, a responsibility to, uh, to continue to elevate the risk that exists. People have forgotten to some extent because it's so long ago, 1985, uh, 86, the, uh, you know, the thousands of, of, of uh, thyroid cancers uh, from that Chernobyl uh, incident. It was. It's not forgotten in Ukraine, uh, but uh, around the world, people forget what happened when uh, when they had that meltdown. So I would I would again come back to uh, the need to have an international uh, response. And long term, John, here's what I would say: that uh, we just can't be in a situation where the 
the world is going to say nuclear power plants are the answer around the planet when wind and solar are much less expensive alternatives in generating uh, non-greenhouse gas emitting uh, 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 technologies up into the air. So uh, we have to be very firm on this okay? uh, and, and just not allow the nuclear salesman to get by, back out on the road and to be hawking these wares when we can see now what the consequences are. There's never been a meltdown of a nuclear, of a solar or a wind facility. Okay. We don't have to worry about the security of those facilities. So long term, I would say let's not at least make it worse in the future. Uh, I would love to hear your suggestions, Sean. You, you've probably done a lot more thinking about, you know, what these safeguards should be. I, I don't want to take over the very scarce time here. No, please. But I would just say the, the long term, is always an interesting challenge, but we are living in a world that has almost 500 nuclear reactors already in it, right. nuclear power plants already in it. And my, my own view is that we have to take some pretty drastic steps, uh, internationally, uh, to deal with the situation of, uh, the vulnerability of nuclear reactors, sure, to terrorists, but also when uh, a region containing nuclear reactors is, is overtaken by a vicious war, uh, what alternatives can we possibly mobilize to make it uh, as as much of a of a a pariah generating action to attack a nuclear power plant mm-hmm. as to use a nuclear weapon? Now, the fact that very few people are aware of is there's much more radioactivity in a commercial nuclear power reactor than would be released even by a very large nuclear bomb. And so the the radioactive danger from attacks on nuclear power plants is very, very large. And we're simply, as a society, not taking it seriously at this. I should mention that uh, under the leadership of my colleague, Anna Bujera, we do have a, a working group that's been meeting reasonably regularly, mostly online, uh, to discuss the dangers uh, at Zaporizhia and the other Ukrainian nuclear power plants and what it then implies for the rest of the world. And I would argue it's not just war. It's also, you could imagine, uh, you know, state collapse, massive social unrest. Imagine if Syria had been operating a one gigawatt uh, light water reactor uh, when the civil war broke out as just one example. And you then have to look at, well, you know, what are the war-torn regions of the world? And then you think, well, wait a minute, a nuclear power plant, if you think in terms of planning, construction, operation, decommissioning, is really a century proposition. What part of the world can I guarantee isn't going to be war-torn? I mean, if you look just at the countries that have nuclear weapons today, eight of the nine in the last century, have had either a war or a revolution on their territory, all of them but the United States. Um, uh, it's a sobering, it's a sobering thought. So I agree with John. I think there's a lot that can be, can and should be done internationally. I think there's new guidance that we should think about issuing from the IEA, new kinds of assistance that we could provide to reactors that, uh, would help them be better protected at least against accidental harm when these kinds of things uh, happen. Uh, it's hard to protect them against you know direct intentional military harm. Uh, uh, just as an example, the research reactor in Australia has a big metal cage over the top of it. makes it much more difficult for a drone, for a stray shell, for a uh, you know, rocket propelled grenade to do any damage, um, and is cheap, simple. Um, uh, so that's just, you know, one, uh, of many, many plausible things that could be done. I also think we need ultimately an international agreement that says not okay to attack civilian safeguarded nuclear power reactors. Next. Um, I think yeah, I think that's so important. But again, just to look ahead, the fifty years, we had already reached an agreement with the Shah of Iran in the mid seventies to sell them six nuclear power plants. You can only imagine 
the situation we would have been in well, if those six nuclear bomb plants had been there after 1979 with the fall of the Shah. Right? And so uh, wh- where would we have been 40 years ago? Right. So uh, people like assume that the Saudi government will be there forever or the Iranian government will be there forever. Uh, and there is no guarantee whatsoever. Uh, and so we that's why, in, 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 at least from an energy source perspective, that's why we should be insisting on wind and solar. We should be insisting that the World Bank, that the IMF, that all of these international institutions are prioritizing uh, non-greenhouse gas, but also non-proliferation technologies uh, that are being sold and deployed around the world because the short-term solution using nuclear fission technologies also leaves the seeds for longer-term I will proliferation ad- risks. I will admit I am a bit more positive about nuclear energy that, than you are. I would argue that the biggest proliferation risks come from the fuel cycle of nuclear energy, the enrichment and reprocessing, which the Shah both of which the Shah also wanted to pursue. Um, I, I am of the view that while there are many challenges and risks with nuclear power that have limited its ability to grow enough to be a really major part of the answer to climate change, climate change is such a hard problem. I would like to work on dealing with those risks enough that we could maybe make it into a, an expandable option. I love being at Harvard because, you know, we can, we can co-mingle the issues, you know what I mean? And it all makes sense. At Harvard, okay? Especially at the Kennedy School. My wife has a degree from the Kennedy School. She's much smarter than me. So, uh, the, um, so from, you know, from, uh, just going back over to this nuclear issue, uh, the, the, um, this, there's an old joke. I don't know if you know, this is an old joke, which is that, the joke is, what would it take to buy the uh, Public Utility Commission of Georgia? And the answer is, the Southern Company is not selling. They already own it. And so <laughs> they, uh, Sean loves the guy. Sean knows what I mean. So, so they wanted to build two nuclear power plants 15 years ago. And it's still building them with 2,400 megawatts. And they're now up to 30 billion dollars to build two nuclear power plants in Georgia because the Southern Company owns the DPU of Georgia. Now, it's very sunny down in Georgia. Uh, You can only imagine how much solar you could deploy in Georgia for 30 billion dollars while you're waiting for these two nuclear power plants to be concluded. Okay, So so I'm not saying that there isn't going to be some role for nuclear in the future, but we would have to completely dispose of every rule that Adam Smith has taught us about a Darwinian paranoia inducing marketplace in order to accomplish it. In fact, Adam Smith is spinning so rapidly in his grave looking at that project that he would be able to get a subsidy for a generation of energy. Okay. So, so I just think that realistically from a market perspective in the United States, it's over. Maybe nuclear fusion can have a life in 15 to 20 years, but that's the beginning of that life. It's only 15 to 20 years from now that they would even have a pilot project. But in terms of the nuclear fission era uh, in new plants, it's over in the United States. And globally, we should help the rest of the world to move in a direction that has more economical, safe, uh, 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 and non-greenhouse gas emitting renewable resources that they invest in as well. That would be my two cents worth of making well, the world safe. One safer. place we can agree is there ain't going to be any more nuclear power plants that look like the ones at Vogel. No, <laughs> the, 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 the Vogel plant, it, it's named after, it's named after the guy who was the chairman of the Southern Company. So, so aptly named. Okay, in terms All right. Of the, we have, uh, I want to turn to the uh, people online for a question or two. This question will shift a little our focus. Uh, what are your opinions on the reduction or elimination of the ground-based leg of the nuclear triad? Is it smart? Would it help? And is it politically possible at some point in the future? Uh, it, it's a good question. You know, ground-based, obviously, they're very vulnerable. You know, you can see them. I actually had, we had Hyman Rickover was the father of our nuclear Navy. And 
we have our nuclear submarines floating around the ocean right now. They each have on board pretty much the capacity to destroy every major city in Russia, which I, every one of the sub commanders has that capacity as they have floating around right now. And I asked them one night, I said, when I had dinner with Hyman Rickover, probably 1983, 84, I said, why do you support these ground-based missiles? And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, I agree with you. We don't need them. But, you know, when I'm in the room, I got to give something to the Air Force. So I have to waste money giving the Air Force, you know, their ground-based missiles so that I can have the invulnerable submarine-based system. That really, you know, what keeps uh, Soviets and others off balance. So I agree with Hyman Rickover. He, I don't think he ever said that publicly. He did tell me that at dinner. Uh, but it's an accurate um, assessment of the vulnerability of those missiles compared to the other protections that you get from the other two parts of the triad. All right. Let's see. Uh, yes, please. Oh, so good to see you. In your conversation with Matthew Bunn just now, you're sometimes talking about ways of diffusing tension, nuclear tension, in various areas of the world. And you're sometimes talking about very profound structural changes, like the elimination of sole authority and first use, and like the diminution in the number of weapons. And my question is about this second area. So you have about four times here and also earlier when we had the first use conference at Harvard in 2017, stress the importance of a large popular movement. It was one of the first things you said, we need a movement. And on the one hand, I agree with you and I try to work for those things. And on the other hand, I'm always puzzled, why exactly do we need the movement? Since, as your legislation on uh, sole use says, restricting first use of nuclear weapons, the reason for it is a constitutional basis, a very stark constitutional basis that obligates the country to have its Congress oversee any entry into war. Um, and, and in cases where we've had to make a big structural change, let's say in desegregating the schools, there was a lot of popular movement, but constitutional scholars usually think that the law courts took the lead, not the popular vote. So why couldn't Congress why don't you feel optimistic that this could be achieved, even if the country isn't yet ready to turn out millions of people in Central Park at this moment? Yeah, um, because inertia is the most powerful force in politics. Uh, and if no attention is brought to an issue, um, expecting the Congress to respond rationally um, is a fool's uh, errand. Okay, so you, you have a responsibility uh, politically um, to go through all three phases of having any issue dealt with. The first phase is political education. The second phase is political activation. The third phase is political implementation. You have to go through all three phases. When Henry Waxman and I passed the climate bill in 2009 uh, out of our committee and through the House floor, we did so without a real public movement. But we had the clout inside to kill it. But similarly... So didn't the oil, gas, and coal industry have the club to kill it in the Senate. And, and we never had that public movement. That's why Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I introduced the Green New Deal in February of 2019 to solve that problem. We're going to have a public movement. We're going to have an education of the American public on this issue. Uh, and they're going to understand the threat that it poses. And that's really what changed in 2020. And young people, 18 to 34, demanded their return on investment. And they got it in 2022 in the bill. And now we have to make sure it gets implemented. But it was political accountability that ultimately changed the way in which the system responded. So to the extent to which the same thing had happened with the nuclear freeze movement, it had created political accountability. It had explained to the American public the danger uh, of having this arms race and having it be uncontrolled. Uh, that's what changed the dynamic. So, and, and by the way, we'll go back to Linus Pauling. He did the same thing, turning into a public health uh, crisis for the planet. So, uh, so I know that we should be able to respond rationally. I know that the senators who sat in that hearing on no first use and heard how scary it is, 
should have immediately said on a bipartisan basis, let's strip Donald Trump of his authority. But a Republican House and Senate was not was never going to do that. You know, what what they what they believe privately, but what they're willing to do operationally in public, two different things. And uh, and so from my perspective, it's always important to just distinguish between the cognitive and the operational. And in order to make something operational, you need a movement, okay? People can agree with you on climate, they can agree with you on non-proliferation, but they get afraid of the status quo. They get afraid of, of, of all of those powers that they will punish them without an obvious reward politically. And as much as I would like people, you know, to just do it for the right reason, I live in a business that uh, actually has to say, if you vote that way, you're going to lose your seat. If you vote that way, we're going to punish you at the polls. You vote that way. There's going to be a movement in your hometown, your district, your state that's going to take you out. So we did that with climate. We actually did it with uh, the nuclear arms buildup of the uh, 80s. Uh, and we have to do it again. We want to move to a no first use regime uh, in our country. Let's take another one from online. All right. This is from Tom Kalina. I support Ukraine, but we cannot deny the nuclear risks in the current war. How far should U.S. go to support Ukraine if that support might provoke Russia to use nuclear weapons? Where is the line? Uh, The line is that we have to tell... Um, Ukraine, which we have, I mean, we have to tell Russia, which we have over and over again, that there will be catastrophic consequences for them if they, if they use nuclear weapons. We have to ensure that we're continuing to build an international coalition that lets them know that, um, that they will pay a generational price if they do it. Uh, uh, and we also have to make clear to them that we're not going to, uh, allow them to destroy the democracy of Ukraine. And we just have to hold both of those things simultaneously. And we can't back down on either one of those principles. So, um, so from my perspective, uh, I support you. Um, and, uh, what Russia is doing is absolutely historically reprehensible. Uh, but we have to let them know that there's a very high price they're going to pay from the global community. Uh, if they use nuclear weapons under any circumstances in that world, they're going to have to figure out how to, how to conduct themselves using uh, conventional weapons. And ultimately, I do believe they're going to lose in that battle. But if they cross the line, they will, they will definitely, uh, have, um, they'll have a scallop letter, uh, that will follow them forever and it will affect them economically, diplomatically, uh, for, uh, a, at least a generation. Well, I'm afraid that while we have certainly not reached the end of the topic or of our interest, we have reached the end of our time uh, that's been allotted today. The senator has a busy schedule. Uh, and so I want to thank Senator Markey for coming to talk to us and for a lively discussion. And I want, I want to apologize to those of you who did not get a chance to uh, ask your question. So thank you again. Thank you. Senator and thank Martin. you for the honor of being with you, Professor, and all of you uh, today, especially the great John Holden, science advisor, President Obama for eight years. Thank you for coming today. Thank you all so much.